<laughs> um, all right. So, so Doug, you and I worked together at Digital Domain. Um, it was uh, part of the highlights of working at Digital Domain was working with you and being in your meetings every week. Um, I uh, would like to introduce you as a see here. You have a background in electrical engineering. You started at University of Colorado. You went yep. on to get your PhD from Ohio State University. So it's Dr. Doug Robel, for the record. That's true. And, uh, and then you, it looks like uh, you went pretty much straight into digital domain. I actually didn't know that until I looked up for, for this interview. You went straight into digital domain um, and just worked as a software engineer. You eventually became creative director, now senior director of software. I think probably every uh, software project that's uh, in-house is probably somehow entering your, your sphere of, of influence. No. And um, so seeing that you went straight from school right into DD, um, what, what inspired you to go into VFX? I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado and I knew I wanted to be a nerd. Um, so uh, electrical engineering, computer science. In, in fact, I'm, uh, I'm of the era where at least at that school, it was difficult to get just a pure CS degree. You had to get electrical engineering and CS at the time because computers were new. <laughs> and and then I, I knew I was, I was fascinated by computers and all things um, like that. And, and electrical engineering, it was very good to have, uh, uh, but I, it's one of those things that I haven't used all that much. So some of my electrical engineering training has faded a bit. Yeah, yeah, I forgot all of my symbols and what they represent. And all my oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice to have some of the familiarity, but uh, don't ask me to build a radio right now. <laughs> um, but you know, and I saw Star Wars, and and I was a big movie fan growing up. And Star Wars came out, and I realized that that would be the dream. It would be to use computers to make films, and even though Star Wars didn't really use a lot of computers other than the motion control um, rigs um, uh, to make films. And so, I. I realized that my artistic talents were, uh, and I wanted to go in uh, from a, a technical standpoint. And I sort of tailored my education towards that end. And at the time, um, Ohio State and Ohio State had a really, really cutting edge computer graphics program. Um, and there was this vibrant community of people experimenting with computer graphics, experimenting with computers, trying to see what could possibly be done. Uh, so I, I was hooked. I was just amazed what you could do with a computer. And I was also interested in computer vision. Yeah. And so um, figuring out what, if you gave the computer what the camera was looking at, um, what you could figure out with that. Gotcha. So I got a, a PhD, and uh, my PhD topic was on um, uh, understanding computers or computer vision and um, solving uh, for a lot of different things going through the lens. And then I got out of school and I realized, okay, now what? Um, so I started applying for jobs and my mom saw an article in the New Yorker about digital domain being started up by James Cameron, Scott Ross and Stan Winston, sent me the article and said, hey, you should go apply to this company. And so I did, and um, uh, had a very interesting interview with Scott Ross. And uh, a month later, I was in Los Angeles um, unpacking boxes there because Digital Domain had been in existence for about three months before I arrived. I was the 33rd employee hired. And um, the rest is history. I, I really found a home there. The place is unbelievably dynamic and vibrant and crazy and, um, and just amazing mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've I've had a really really good time working at digital I mean uh, you're the 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 uh, I don't want to say oldest uh, the most experienced uh, person thing. with the longest tenure at digital domain uh, you, yes. by far actually yeah so I've been there since the beginning and um, uh, there's there are a couple of people who are like a year later than me that are still a digital domain, but um, yeah, that's about it. Okay. Now um, I was surprised. I didn't I didn't understand how much your PhD was involved in computer vision, and then here you are all the way to now. Why don't you tell us what you're working on now? Because it really ties straight in. It seems to me like a lot of people go to school don't necessarily do exactly kind of what they went to school for, and here you are full circle doing exactly what you went to school for. Tell us a little bit, or as close as you can. Tell, tell us uh, 
What what you're working on now? It's pretty wild. That's a really good point. I hadn't even thought about that. I I <laughs> really haven't. I am. My career has been fairly focused on what I started with, and and I continue with it to this very day. So at Digital Domain, we've got a small software team, um, but man, they do a lot of cool stuff. Uh, over the last five years, we have. Over the, my career, we've uh, tackled a whole bunch of things. Um, you know, DD was the original author of Nuke. Uh, we built uh, and Bill Spitzak and others at Digital Domain wrote Nuke from the ground up, and uh, eventually, you know, sold it to the foundry. Um, we did uh, computer vision stuff. We've done fluid simulation stuff. We've done. Um, uh, volume representations. Uh, there's all sorts of techniques that you can find in Houdini that originally started at Digital Domain. But over the last five years, we really have focused. Instead of going uh, very wide across all these fields, we focused on character creation and uh, character animation, trying to create realistic digital things or you know, people. And so that's been what we've been doing. We've got a really cool program for doing um, hair called Samson that has been um, the product of a lot of software developers. Right now, Gene Lin is leading that up. And we have um, muscles and skin simulation that um, David Miner and Michael Ewart are writing. And then we have all this stuff for doing facial animation and a real-time simulation of uh, humans. And that is a huge team that uh, uh, takes us from capturing what people do and translating with that capture into what digital characters are doing and then producing realistic digital characters that have extraordinary amounts of detail. This whole project is being led by Darren Hendler and some of our software developers like Lucy or Mosser and Mark Williams are key contributors to this. And, and we have just done a brilliant team. Um, Melissa Sell is leading up a lot of the real-time aspects of it all. And uh, you can kind of see there's all this, this intense focus on hair and muscles and skin and facial performance and the, how the character moves. Um, and then after all that, we started doing it in real time. We realized that with uh, the incorporation of a lot of machine learning stuff, while machine learning takes a lot of time to train, once it gets going, it runs really, really fast. And so um, that's that led to the TED Talk that I did where I was controlling a digital copy of me alongside me. And now, right now this year, uh, yeah, more than a year after the TED Talk, we are working on creating that kind of quality, even better quality, um, uh, that can talk on its own. So it's a, an autonomous character that you can tell what to do and it will talk to you and, and uh, interact with you. It's uh, extraordinarily fun. And while it is still on, on track from what I had started out with, it is so different. And all this new stuff about uh, how do you get a character to talk automatically just totally new and then and a monstrous field and brand new stuff to me and our crew so it's great fun well, if anyone fun. if anyone hasn't seen it i'll make sure to link below to the ted talk as well as to the recent article that i saw darren um uh post just recently on your latest work with with masquerade and, and really uh you know just seeing the a year later you can just tell how it's continuing to develop you mentioned the role of ml uh, machine learning in this and um i, I was going to ask you about uh either how you guys were using machine learning either in this case and also uh, and that might lead to, you know, where else machine learning you're seeing. I'm seeing it show up in a lot of different areas of VFX. So I kind of want to get a sense of where you uh, see it maybe getting used more and more as we move forward. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the key thing with machine learning is that um, it, it, it can be used to do a lot of things that were difficult. And uh, I'm telling everybody in this, uh, the software team, you don't have to use machine learning. Sometimes just a, a direct program will uh, solve the problem that you're trying to solve. But um, often machine learning can really make difficult things less difficult or, or difficult in its own way, let's say. 
<laughs> the, the, the ML uh, talks at Seagraph this year highlighted that it is very complex and difficult to do machine learning. But like you said, what it achieves is things that would be near impossible um, or be, be difficult from a time scale sense, right? Uh, it, it would be take you years to do what machine learning can start getting you forward to in weeks and months. Um, and, and you yeah, guys, I mean, and, and, and as an example of that, um, think about how the face moves. Um, there have been over the years, all sorts of different ways of trying to animate a face. So, because it does all this crazy stuff, you watch what a, somebody's face does and it goes all over the place. It's a very deformable, malleable thing. Um, so blend shapes, you know, uh, things that are very animator friendly that, uh, they can sculpt and, um, merge together to produce shapes or, uh, there've been some really interesting things about using physically based muscles and skin to try to actually simulate the anatomy of a, a face, um, that have produced really, really compelling results, but they're extraordinarily expensive. Mm. And all of this stuff is like, okay, how do it's science? It's here's something that's your face is this physical object that we want to model and we want to try to understand it in one way or the other. But then you take machine learning and you say, well, hold on. What if we were able to train something where we just showed it a lot of faces, a lot of how somebody's face moves? And instead of trying to figure out all the volume preserving physics of what's going on in a, a muscle that controls how your cheek raises, we'll just let the machine figure it out after looking at thousands and thousands of example poses of your face. Of course, that's its own kind of difficulty. You have to collect and make sure all the data is correct and you have to curate it all. But then you literally kind of just press a button and let the computer just sort of spin on how the face moves. And all of a sudden you've got this thing that can move the face more realistically than any kind of physical simulation. And it's, it, it changes the way you look at how to solve problems, right? You, you're like, okay, now, now I need to do the finite element of how uh, uh, modeling of uh, a volume preserving flesh deformation. Nah, I'm gonna throw that out. I'm just gonna gather 10,000 frames of somebody's face moving and then let the computer come up with a model on its own. Now, of course you can't, you can't control the model at all. You get what you get, but oh yeah. my gosh, it, it's just unbelievable. And then it runs really, really fast. Mm. Um, and are you using it, uh, um, if, if you can say, are you are you using CPU uh, farms to do that that those those machine learning tasks? Are you using uh, like GPU farms to do the 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 AI tasks? I know in outside of um, VFX and HPC, um, using big arrays of GPU is the way to get massive parallel processing. I was finding on the VFX side it was still a little bit more of the uh, workflows of CPU rendering, just much faster and much more uh, smaller 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 jobs many of them, but they were still using CPU farms here and there. So I was curious how you guys divvied up your workload, whether you're able to use your CPU farm for this task. Well, we are addicted to big GPUs right now, um, but big GPUs are expensive. And over the years, um, our render farms are filled with a lot of CPU power rather than GPU power. We're pivoting towards that. And so um, now, by and large, new computers that we're buying actually have GPUs in them, even if they're just meant to be on the farm. And this, this applies not only for machine learning, but also for the latest renderers, right? And the, uh, the amount of speed that you're getting using GPUs to do the rendering, whether it's V-Ray or Redshift or RenderMan or anybody, they all have GPU acceleration. Yes, so, the XPU kind of approach, right? We're using exactly. GPU. Admittedly, um, I've specced and designed and, and sold um, handfuls of machines that often not, you know, rooms full of machines, right? But handfuls right. of machines that would be, uh, you know, dual core, 
big heavy CPU machines with two or four GPUs, uh, allowing folks to, and I'm, I'm a big fan, coming from my render resource uh, background, of trying to create the ultimate machine. Of course, the right. ultimate machine comes at premium because you're getting all the parts on. But once you have it there, it becomes an incredibly flexible tool that can be used everything from an artist workstation to a render machine to, uh, yeah. So I encourage, training. Right. I encourage a lot of studios to uh, you know focus on using your floor, GPU farm, and start thinking of a small subset for daytime iteration, for you know when you need to blast things through GPU. But otherwise, most studios do have anywhere from a couple of hundred uh, GPUs or more just scattered across the floor, often doing the simplest renders of all, comp renders at night, when they right. could be using GPU. So that's usually where I start the conversation. Even though it doesn't lead to a sale, and I'm in sales now, it's like don't think about buying it yet until you're using your floor. Once you're using your floor, then start seeing what you want to buy. You want to buy a big array and start blasting, or do you want to buy these types of machines, which is still the most popular. If you watch what, like, the computers or how NVIDIA is, is dealing with all this, um, of course, they talk about their GPUs and the number of CUDA cores that they have and the amount of compute that each one of the GPUs comes up with. But also, like you said, it's, it's the whole enchilada. Often in, a, like, machine learning setup, there's the GPU that's doing the math. It's doing all the linear algebra that you're slamming and all the multiplies. But there's this huge lake of data that you need to get into the GPU. And so the computers that are ideal for machine learning not only have some big GPUs with a lot of parallel processing capability, but they also have this pipe that you can take terabytes worth of data and start throwing it through the GPU relatively quickly. And, and it's often not, or I wasn't really paying attention to what NVIDIA or, or AMD or any of these companies are doing, um, but they're talking about cores, but they're also talking about throughput for the card and how yeah. fast you can get it. And so, yeah. In the HPC areas that my company deals with, um, we see uh, nanosecond latency being the measure, so um, you know, which is crazy from the VFX back where, where we get away with like, well, can we get it done in twelve milliseconds of latency and ten milliseconds? Oh, it'll work. Um, here, they're having to get the now. Of course, this is between the storage and the server, but right. they need to get, uh, yeah, like one point five. That one of them, at one point, it was a, it was a single day. It was like one point. How do you get below one point four nanoseconds of latency or something outrageously? You know, like you're just hitting the you know, the edges of the speed of light problems, you know, yeah, right there. Right. <laughs> and what so that? hearing that really, uh, I, I kind of, after being at this bigger company for a while, I've taken the joke back to VFX a few times that, you know, we're buying race cars and then we're driving around the parking lot really fast. <laughs> These <laughs> folks are taking them out to the Autobahn and to the racetrack and doing big racing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're seeing that. Yeah. We, we see in, in, a, in for the most extreme examples being uh, automated driving where you're seeing growths, in some of their biggest vendors, or some of the biggest uh, uh, technology providers, uh, they're, they're, they grow in petabytes per day. Petabytes they grow per day. In they petabytes? grow in petabytes per day. They'll grow one and a half petabyte, a half petabyte, two petabytes. And so they pretty much have these, uh, they're pushing the limits of Isilon. That's where I learned it through is the Isilon Dell folks. But they push the limits of, you know, max clusters. You start thinking about, you know, we have clusters in our studios of 20 and 30 uh, Isilon nodes. You know, these start to talk about, this, you start to learn why they have to, are, are bragging going from things like 256 to 512 max clusters. Uh, not that I, I believe, I don't know if it goes to 512. But so, yes, it is crazy where AI is going, but we're seeing it also. So we're seeing a lot of the automated tasks, of course, with um, Roto. There's like a handful right. of products now coming right. out. They're trying to get what we were, was the simple, the simple work, you know. Um, but, you know, it does hopefully free up these artists to move into the more complex world. We had a press release about Masquerade 2, and that is an extraordinarily cool example of that because it's hard, right? It's, uh, there would be one or two shots going on. Well, the, the, the Masquerade 2 process that we've developed makes it, really easy to take facial performance, capture it, process that capture, which used to be a pain in the butt, and then create digital characters that look like the person that was moving it all in one shot. It's, it's a very smooth pipeline. So for movies like Thanos, where, or you know, the, the Avengers, where we did the round, I don't know, 40, 
well, there's a certain number of shots of Thanos, and I, I don't know the exact number, but it wasn't huge, right? It was, uh, he was on screen for a lot, but it wasn't an enormous amount. We're doing projects now with 30 to 40 hours of motion capture, wow. which is multiple characters, just hours and hours and hours, and, 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 and where 40 hours of a character um, doing things. Now, this is for video games, but it could be for film, it could be for anything. You can have these characters now that the process of capturing the, the performance and taking it to a digital character is no longer the barrier. It's not, okay, we've got four months and we'll have you, have you something. Now you can just start the pipe and, okay, here's an hour of performance, here's another hour of performance, here's another hour of performance. And now the artists, um, have this resource where they don't have to worry about, you know, the points on the face moving around. They just get the character and they can start doing things with it. That's, so, yeah. um, that, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So the incremental cost or the marginal cost for each additional hour of output, so to speak, um, starts to really amortize or benefit from the, the time and energy you put on the inputs. So exactly. You know, so five and 10 hours, and then you get that 20 and 30 hours of time, you're still dealing with the same inputs, which was the, which is still a time consuming, but was the time consuming part prior. And yes, most VFX and animation is very linear. If you want, you know, double the amount of output, it's going to be double the cost, right? Or something close to that. So yeah, yeah apps, that's amazing. Yeah, that, that changes the curve uh, for yep. sure. And, and that's what we're seeing across uh, with machine learning across the board. It's, um, it, it just takes things that were difficult and makes it, you know, um, much easier to pipeline and much more robust to some things. But of okay. course, it's always, you know, at a cost with machine learning, like we're doing a lot of things with neural rendering, right? Where you have the, um, the, the machine learning process that you've created do the final stages of rendering to bring it to reality. But unlike a renderer, if you don't like the results of the machine learning output, it's really hard to change. It's like, I, you get what you get. I know what reality is. And if you don't like what my reality is, then um, yeah, uh, tough crunchies. <laughs> in the early days of simulation, I was hearing um, that experience from a few different people at Seagraph as well, where you, know, you try to recreate it and you get a slightly different result. I remember this being a big problem with simulation back in the day, where re-rendering a simulation, uh, like a Houdini simulation or, a, or a, like a massive sim, uh, right. would... Yeah. would would generate different results. I mean, we had to, you know, once you had it rendered, you had to save everything because, you know, you couldn't yeah. change it. You couldn't just reset. Now, of course, you can take any Houdini sim. And heck, you can practically move it from Intel to AMD and still get the same exact results. So I, I expect that with ML, you know, yeah. that will also get there where you can just turn the dial and then... In fact, uh, with machine yeah. learning, that one of the biggest research top... Well, there's lots of research topics, but... It, there's this, this black box that is the machine learning stuff. And now people are saying, wait, 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 wait. And what if we separate this out and get into the details of it? And can we actually tease out controls from that black box that we can actually use? It's extraordinarily exciting. Um, uh, there are, uh, it, it's all, if you ever hear the word latent space in machine learning, that's basically this this representation of what the computer knows that's somewhere in that black box. And if you can come up with a way of adequately manipulating the mission of the latent space so that you can control basically how the machine is thinking, um, then you've got power. And so mm. there's a lot of research out there that says, wow, if and we've figured out how to disentangle like the pose of a character's head from the latent space. And so now instead of just Getting what the computer told us the pose was, you can actually control the pose. And so you can re-render a character's head in a different pose where all you, it's just amazing technology. Uh, you're really getting really sorry. It seems like we're really starting to penetrate that latent space then. And, yep, 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 the, yep. The, dark, yep. the dark matter is getting mapped out, so to speak, right? Nice analogy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I, I would imagine ML will be part of the answer here, but where, where are you most excited about then um, coming in this coming years here? Obviously we're hitting exponential curves of change and growth. And uh, that's always fun to, to chase up that exponential curve. What yep. are you seeing? Where are you seeing these areas coming out? Well, what do you expect over the next uh, you know, three, five plus years? Well, yeah, machine learning, of course, is, is part of everything. Um, but one of the cool things that I've 
gotten really excited about is all the different technology that's out there that I wouldn't have thought would have been related to visual effects or the, the creation of a character. Well, kind of. So the, the autonomous character that we're putting together requires speech recognition. So if somebody is talking to our character, we have to understand what the, that person is saying. Speech synthesis, the character has to sound like somebody, so we have to be able to control the character. There's this conversational AI that controls the behavior of the character, so what the character is going to say, but also what the character is doing. And all the rest of the stuff, so the facial motion, the expressions, the, what the character is actually doing, all of this technology is, is new to us. Who, who would have used all this stuff, speech recognition, all this stuff in visual effects? It's, it's not what we do. But now that I'm seeing what this stuff is capable of, um, it is actually terribly useful in visual effects. All these things are, are possible. For instance, there's a really cool program, um, a research paper that just came out a couple of years, or uh, years, weeks ago, called Wave to Lip. And what this thing will do is use kind of speech synthesis or recognition technology. And if you give it an audio waveform, it will change the video that it sees so that the mouth lip syncs the audio. So if you, had, if you took the video that you're taking right now and you took my voice out and put somebody else's voice in, my lips would move with that new voice. And just things like that, yeah. that, that little piece of technology gives us amazing um, possibilities in visual effects or editing. So say we create a visual effect, everything gets good, but then the, uh, the, the script gets changed and we're like, shoot, the character is saying the wrong thing. And I think so about this all of a sudden, yeah. we just have the actor re-record the voice. We don't have to go on set. We don't have to reshoot the whole thing. We just re-record the voice and we change how the, act, uh, the actor's face makes the words. Boom! Yeah. And you're like, what? Is this possible now? How is this possible? This is impossible. their whole face, not just doing sort of a Forrest Gumpian lip painting and not, you know, props to ILM. It was well, like <laughs> you know, it's research paper. So the, the first results are a little, uh, you know, they're, they're compelling, but not, you know, I don't think they'd make it in uh, you know, an 8K film. But um, uh, it's, it just came out two weeks ago. Give it a, uh, six months. It'll be used in every film that you see. What kind of advice do you have for the folks that want to get into visual effects or virtual human or now the expansive, you know, sort of scope of what you're dealing with, right? Um, how do, what do you expect for folks who may be uh, entering into school or thinking about going to school or just coming out? What's your advice? The, the really effective artists that I see are artists who are sort of tapped into technology that are that are not afraid to use technology, and that are uh, have learned to combine technology with their art skills, the the, the craft. Um, we're working with some amazing artists who are watching the research papers that are coming out from machine learning and sort of saying, "Hey, could I use this with?" what I'm doing here, you know, I, I've got, I'm creating the scene in Maya, but I saw this research paper that could be really useful. And then they come to the software team and we start tick, 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 tick. And it is, in these days, it's even easier than that because a lot of times with the research papers, there's GitHub implementations of the research papers. So you can just download them and give it a shot and see how it works. It, it might not, be the thing that you actually need, but it gives you this huge leg up on what you're actually trying to do. So, mm -hmm. um, so think about what's happening there. You have to have the familiarity with the tools that you're using. And these are things like Maya and Houdini and all this. So to be able to create the art, you have to have a background in art to understand just the, whether what you're creating is good or not, <laughs> you know, is, is, is got some art in it. And then there's all this, this technology. So being able to download something from GitHub and actually get it to run 
if you get to that level, then all of a sudden you are in a very happy space for being able to work in visual effects. Now, if you wanted to actually write software and create these things, then you're also going to need to know the mathematics. And the mathematics, it's always about the core math, it, linear algebra, statistics. Statistics, I used to hate statistics, but it's so important now. So probability and statistics are huge with machine learning. Mm -hmm. And then just um, calculus, you know, the, the, the core things. Yeah. It's hard to sort of say, learn this, because the fields are changing so quickly. Uh, but you need to have this solid foundation of being able to look at a piece of mathematics or a piece of software and understand what's going on. Fantastic. And, and you're right. I've seen the most successful artists and even tool developers um, vacillate between those two roles throughout their career. Um, yeah. A lot of the render wranglers that I would start, I would, would you know, often come in as trained artists, but then after being in, in behind the scenes of render wrangling, where you really see the guts of, of pipelines, they get sort of entranced into going in that direction. I think Melissa Sell, you mentioned be a great example of that, where just dived straight into that tech area, but has the artistic background and will possibly vacillate back and forth. But when you can kind of work on some shots and work on the tools, you become a great tool developer for the artists. And then you know how to use those tools so well as, as an artist, you, you really, it's great to see folks, uh, between and I see folks even it with director titles like still hopping on shots sometimes because a it keeps them limber and because they can help yeah yep. and, and and sometimes at the VFX shops it's they just need the help we got a lot of shots Are left we kids? got a week who could pick up a, a Wacom pen and help you're, yep. you're hired right uh, which is also a great way to get uh, promoted with an visual effects company is helping out at the last minute uh, above your pay grade, then all of a sudden they recognize you're the kind of guy who will, or, or, or woman who can move up into this role and maybe we should give you a chance. So I've seen Absolutely. that a lot happen out of the wrangling departments, especially. Of course, I'm always advocating for a wrangling as an entry level. Uh, but if you are, if you can uh, jump that and go straight into an internship, working in a software group, well, heck, take the leap. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, Doug, it's always been a pleasure. I appreciate your time and uh, this morning and everything. And uh, be safe and all that in this new world, right? We always got to remind everyone to be safe and listen to whoever the authorities are telling you uh, to maybe put a mask on or something. Uh, whatever they say, <laughs> wherever you are, just do it. Uh, I always wear a mask. Come on. It's, so yeah, I've got just, we've got piles of them here. You bet. So yeah. um, anyway, I do hope to run into you again, uh, not just at a virtual conference, but uh, one way or another, I'm sure we'll cross paths here in the next year or so. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Doug. And I, of course, you are very, fairly publicly accessible here on LinkedIn. They can reach out to you there. And if somebody uh, wants to send me a message, I can pass it on to Doug. I'm more than happy. Okay. All right. Thanks, Doug. Um, but uh, if you uh, stop recording, Mm-hmm.